In the name of the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. How are things in your church at the moment? I get asked from time to time. Have people come back since the pandemic? Is everything returning to normal? Will I be able to sing? And when I'm asked that, I usually say this. Things are good in our church. We've taken a little while to remember the rhythms of worship together again, but it feels as though everything is normal for now even if that means that some things are not necessarily a return to what they were. Some people haven't managed to come back to worship with us in person, but thanks to technology and a steady team of volunteers, many of those can join us online. And we've managed to stay in touch, at least, with pretty much everyone. And we've seen some new faces, and we've welcomed people from new homes. And yes, you can sing. But I've realized in recent days there's a part of our worship which in Radley has only fairly recently returned. You might think that it's hardly the most important part of our Sundays together, and in fact, you might not have even noticed it was missing to begin with, or been able to name the date that it came back. Here it is. We have only very recently begun with having an offertory procession. Just before the Eucharistic prayer, the tradition of two members of the congregation bringing bread and wine from the back of the church and handing them to the priest at the altar where they become the bread of life and cup of salvation has only been with us for a few months or so. I want to talk about the offertory procession this morning because in Deuteronomy 26, we get what might be considered the very first offertory procession. To set the scene for where we are in the Old Testament, <clears throat> this is a passage that Moses gi uh, gives to the people near to the end of their 40-year wander through the wilderness, but before they have yet crossed the River Jordan and entered into the Promised Land. And at the conclusion of this long section of teaching, Moses gives this instruction about the summer harvest and how it is to be presented in the Jerusalem temple. You shall take some of the first of all of the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. Once it's been given to the priest, they will then lay it down on the altar before God. And then the story of how God delivered Israel from Egypt and brought them to the land that was promised in the covenant shall be recited. In other words, then, when we have an offertory procession, this is what we are recalling and reenacting. We bring before God our gifts of bread and wine. We set someone aside to place them upon the altar, and then together we tell the story of our own salvation, which in Israel's case always meant recounting the story of the Passover and the Exodus, and in our case, is always shaped about remembering the Last Supper. In many ways, the offertory procession is also the thing that we regularly do in worship that most resembles what we particularly focus on at harvest. Because harvest festivals are the moment in the church's year which bring together creation and heaven, the very beginning of the story and the very last things. Obviously, harvest is about creation. In some years, that means we focus on the shortcomings of our own treatment of creation. But it doesn't mean that the only thing we do at harvest is turn to lament. Instead, remembering that creation is God's gift to us is always about cultivating gratitude. We're thankful first that there is anything at all, that God chose to bring a universe into being, put breath into our bodies, and to offer us a wonderful, diverse, complex, and beautiful creation 
as a place to be with us. We're thankful, second, that in this marvelous arena, life is not just created, but sustained. Just as plants need water, light, and conditions for growth, so do we. And God gives us all that we need, not just to survive, but to be God's friends and to enjoy God's company. When we bring bread and wine to the table, they don't just represent the natural world being brought to the altar, they represent us too. It's where we bring our money, the harvest of our work, and it's where we bring our prayers, asking that God will transform all that is offered as gift and return to us the things that we need to sustain us forever. Just as the offertory procession is the moment in the Eucharist that we give thanks for all we have been given and offer all of who we are back to God, so is Harvest Festival the Sunday in the year when we give thanks for the whole of creation, our very existence and our continued flourishing and remember that both are gifts that are entrusted to us. But Harvest is not just about creation. It's also about heaven. The Deuteronomy reading continues in these words, remembering what God has done and what God has promised. It says, The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power, with signs and wonders, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. When we bring our gifts and ourselves up to the altar, it's not just giving thanks for the past, it's a profound anticipation of the future. Just as God had many centuries before promised to Abraham that his descendants would one day have a land to inherit as their own and was now making good on that promise, so do we recall that God has promised us not just to be with us now, but forever. Harvest is a helpful image of both creation and heaven because it's really about both life and death. The grain that is given life in the field has to be cut and crushed at the harvest. Only then can it become the bread of life. So the harvest of the land becomes for us an anticipation of the final harvest, when God will gather all together bring it in, and transform it into abundant food that will never run out. So harvest is the point at which creation and heaven are brought together. And in the Bible, we have another name for the point which brings creation and heaven together. We call it Jesus. If creation is the theatre in which the drama of salvation is played out, then Jesus is the moment God becomes not just the author of the drama, but the definitive character within it. Jesus shows us not just life, but life in all its fullness. And Jesus is also subjected to death. Like the grain of harvest, he's cut down. He tells us that his body is broken like bread, and his blood is like wine poured out. But just as the Israelites brought before God the first fruits of what their harvest had produced as token of the abundance of their fields, Jesus is also the first fruits of God's salvation and the promise of what is to come. In his resurrection, we get an anticipation of the life that is offered to us not just now, but forever. Around the table at the Eucharist, the bread and wine we share is not just a recognition of what has been provided, but the way in which we shape ourselves around the meal that we will be eating with God for eternity. Harvest is when we bring forward the first fruits place them upon the altar of God and tell the story of our salvation. 
In creation, the universe is the first fruits of God's intention to be with us and to provide all that we need to flourish in relationship. In Jesus, we see the first fruits of how that relationship is turned into forever. And what we come to see as we bring the beginning of the story and the end, creation and heaven together, is that our lives are really one long offertory procession too. In prayer every day, we bring the first fruits of our lives to place on God's altar and we prepare ourselves to be transformed forever by God's story. That's the story that Harvest tells us. And it's the story of everything we ever needed to know about how to be God's people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.